Good morning and welcome everyone for everyone who has gathered to join us digitally on our live stream or whether you are joining us through our recording that's uploaded to our YouTube channel. Now, there's a few people that I would like to thank. First of all, David Hamilton who guides us so wonderfully, skillfully and creatively from the organ bench. Elaine Holmes and Diane Hinkenhoff who are assisting with the singing this morning so thankfully you don't have to hear just my voice. Sarah McKenzie, who takes care of putting the slide presentation together. John and Mary Phillips in the balcony way up there in the heights, who are working very hard uh, despite the fact that we know that we've got some difficulties with the technology as far as some of the sound. I know that there were some of you last week who indicated that to us, and we are working on it. We've got a professional who will hopefully be coming down to fix that in not too distant future. To Stu Metzger, who is, uh, takes care of the building for us. And while he was away on holiday for the last week, it has been Ralph Knowles and uh, uh, Jack Nanskeville who have been taking care of the chores that they can. John Phillips and John Brash should take care of the finances. Thank you to everyone who makes all of that happen. When we're reading on the screens, which is always, the red print in bold is for the worship leader to read. In this case, that's me. And the black print and bold is for everyone to read together as you follow Mary Phillips. Let's try that as we acknowledge the land on which we are privileged to gather. For thousands of years, First Nations people have lived on this land and by these waters, this relationship is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We are gathered as a non-Indigenous community of faith on the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and acknowledge their stewardship through the ages. We seek to live together in respect, friendship, and peace. Jesus calls us into the world to love one another as we are loved by God. There are a few announcements that I'd like to highlight for you. First of all, donation tax receipts are almost ready. so. And to ensure smooth delivery for both paper and email receipts, we need to make sure we've got your correct contact information. So if anything has changed in your email or mailing address, please be certain you notify the church, and that way we can get the uh, paperwork to you as, uh, in a timely fashion. For those who have received their tax receipt by mail last year, but would like to receive them by email this year, then give John Phillips a, a call. Uh, you'll see the information there, and you can find his contact information on our website as well. 
believe it or not, there is a savings to the church if we do it by email. And happy birthday to Louise Curry one day ago. Yesterday, she turned 102. And last year, many of our congregation and others sent birthday cards to her in celebration of her 101st. This year, since it's a day after, why not give her a phone congratulations? As well, I'm going on holiday starting tomorrow and extending through to the end of Sunday next week. And yes, while I'm away, if you have an emergency, please feel free to contact the Reverend Jerry Hofstetter, who was a retired United Church minister living in Southampton. The information to contact him will be both on our phone as a message system as well as on our website. And Ash Wednesday is the beginning of Lent. And that is on March the 2nd this year. So at 7 o'clock on March the 2nd, there will be a worship service marking the beginning of this season of contemplation. If we are able to worship in person uh, uh, for the imposition of ashes, uh, then things will change. But if you wish to have ashes delivered, give me a shout and we'll make sure that that happens so that you can do it remotely in your own home. As well, our annual congregational meeting will take place on Sunday, February 20th. That's in three weeks after the live stream worship service. So please feel free to participate by Zoom. All the information for that meeting will be forthcoming on our website. All members and adherents are encouraged to attend. At the end of February, which is really the last Sunday just before Lent, there will also be a service of prayers with the music of Tizé in France. If you uh, long for a service that is deeply spiritual, filled with silence, time to contemplate, and refrains that are sung as a mantra for meditation, this is the service for you. As well, we want to support the local food bank, and uh, this time, because we doubt that we'll be able to get together for the annual pancake supper, on Shrove Tuesday, which is the day just before Lent begins, we have a goal of serving all 112 households that make use of our local food bank. And so we're going to give each household a box of uh, all-in-one pancake mix and a small bottle of real maple syrup as a bit of a treat for the beginning of Lent. So if you wish to contribute to that, please make your check out to Pancake Supper or rather make it out to Concordia United Church and put in that in, uh, the, the, it is for Pancake Supper. As well, we'll be studying uh, um, Emergence Christianity from Phyllis Tickle during Lent. Begins on March the 3rd, and then it skips a week, and then we'll begin again on the 17th of March and continue for a total of six weeks. More information will be coming on our website with Zoom link. The Lenten devotional booklet, Lesser Evils, Daily Reflections on Seeking Wisdom, is now available. I have delivered uh, three copies uh, so far, and I know there are others that, that might want them. Just give us a shout, and we'll make sure you get a copy. Finally, as the church has done for millennia, I greet you. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. And I'd invite you to share that peace with each other where if you've got people with you or hold those people in your heart that you want to share your, the peace of Christ with. As we um, remember and trust in God's presence amongst us and within us, surrounding us and supporting us, let us prepare ourselves for worship.
May the light of Christ guide us so that we can follow the path of justice and of self-giving love. In Christ's name, may it be so. Let's join together in the call to worship and prayer of approach that you'll find on your screens. Come to worship God in this now familiar digital space. We come seeking meaning and purpose and wonder. Come to discover the ways that the risen Christ lives within us all. We come yearning for nurture and for strength in our living. Come to chat in prayer, connected and unified by the Spirit. Here we are, Creator God, opening our hearts to you. Here we are, weary and worn by two years of pandemic, longing for the old familiar ways of being and becoming. Here we are, wondering at those ways and how they need transforming. Here we are, weary of you moving us to a new place, a radical place. Here we are, living Christ, seeking resurrection, but weary and worried. Here we are, still, full, faithfully eager to hear your word. Amen. Let's join together in singing the first hymn, Lord Speak to Me. Whenever we feel unworthy, like we don't matter, as if no one notices, the risen Christ assures us that each person can make a difference in love. Whenever we feel we don't measure up, like we're failures, as if we never get it right, the living spirit moves us to new insights, revealing our unique blessedness. Whenever we feel overwhelmed, like we can't cope, as if there's nothing more to do, God, who is love, breathes into our souls with energy and with strength. This is the grace God showers upon us all because we are worthy of love's power. As we accept God's blessing and grace, let us take time to commune with God soul deep opening ourselves to possibility and to promise of transformation as we pray. Amen. So often in times like this pandemic, in times when people feel ever more isolated or alone, 
We need the assurance of God's presence with us, even when it's hard to perceive. So, let's share this story. God's hand, sorry, God's hand painted the world with light, with color. God says, I am the artist. God loves you, knows your name when you are born, what you dream and what makes you sad. God knows that you need what you need better than anyone. God cares. God says, I am your parent. When people are in love, they kiss. Parents braid hair and friends talk on the phone. Kids hug their dog. It's love. God says, I am love. Why gravity? How do stars burn? Why is there love? What happens when we die? Wonder, questions, awe. But answers? God says, I am mystery. Sometimes we hurt or fall down. God picks us up. God helps us start over. God never stops loving us. God says, I am unfailing. God speaks to us through Jesus and other people. When we ask for help, God answers. God says, I am the voice of wisdom. The world is full of roads to take and choices to make. God knows the right road. God knows the right way. God will lead you. God says, I am one and you are mine. Follow me. As you grow, you can know God better and better. God longs for you to love each other as much as God loves you. God knows you have that gift. God is the beginning and the end, the first and the last. God says, I am. God loves each of us, showing us how to love each other. It's not about getting and keeping, because it's about sharing and caring. Let's live into that reality as we share the Lord's Prayer in the paraphrase that it will come up on your screen. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and what shall be, Father and Mother of us all, loving God, in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. The first Bible reading is Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10 in the Old Testament. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Let's join together in singing the second hymn, Jesus, Teacher, Brave and Bold.
the second the second Bible reading is Luke chapter 4 verses 21 to 30 from the paraphrase the message every eye in the place was on him intent then he started in you've just heard scripture make history it came true just now in this place all who were there watching and listening were surprised at how well he spoke but they also said isn't this Joseph's son, the one we've known since he was just a kid? He answered, I just suppose you're going to quote the proverb, Doctor, go heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we heard you do in Capernaum. Well, let me tell you something. No prophet is ever welcome in his hometown. Isn't it a fact that there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah during that three and a half years of drought when famine devastated the land. But the only widow to whom Elijah was sent was in Sarapada, in Sidon. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elijah. But the only one cleansed was Naaman the Syrian. That set everyone in the meeting place seething with anger. They threw him out, banishing him from the village then took him to a mountain cliff at the edge of the village to throw him to his doom. But he gave them the slip and was on his way. together in prayer. Loving God, into this space and into our hearts, may you continue to be ever-present. Move around a bit, stir us up, and let us know you're there. And then speak to us your words of wisdom, of direction, of radical justice. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can see from the title slide that Sarah chose, I think it's just perfect to reflect the sermon title that I chose, but we've never done it that way. I think it's, it's really uh, hilarious because so often that's exactly the kind of thing that I hear over and over again in churches, whether this one or others I have served or those that I run into all the time, including the home congregation in which I grew up. And it's, it's often when things go awry that we actually pay attention. For example, bulletin bloopers. Now, you know that um, uh, often when office coordinators are putting down the bulletin, putting the slides together, that, that they, they try and rely on what they've done in the past, just like all of us do, because it's more efficient. And this one will, will catch David, I think, because uh, the music that we have that brings us into the worship space called the prelude. Well, there was one office uh, administrator who looked at it and thought, well, the music that's at the end of the service, if it's a prelude for the beginning, it should be the Detroit at the end. Or uh, in the offering, there was a typo that came into the prayer. You know how at the very end, everybody says often the same phrase? In this case, it was the, the prayer to bless the offering, and it said, in Jesus' name we pay. <laughs> it's those kinds of things that demonstrate to us that when things go differently, it catches our attention, and it makes us focus and, and, and realize that something is a little off kilter. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing when he was given the scroll from Isaiah he read from the scroll, and it was a revolutionary text from Isaiah because it was talking about turning the whole world upside down. The, the rich and the powerful would be put down, and the, the, the poor and the, and the 
the marginalized would we put on the top. It was the blind seeing and the lame walking, and it was the year of Jubilee. Now, in the Hebrew Scriptures, the year of Jubilee comes every 50 years. And in those 50 years, all kinds of stuff might happen. But on the 50th year, if you sold property to someone, then it reverts to the original owner. If someone has been unjustly accused, they are freed. It was a way of turning the world upside down. And it was in the Hebrew Scriptures, it was part of, of the Leviticus passage that was a command from God through Moses. And interestingly, never once was that ever observed in the Jewish na nation, ever. But it was an attitude of aspiration for many. Jesus read that, and you could just see the people in the, in the synagogue looking at Jesus and going, oh yeah, yeah, we've heard that one before. Good one. I like that one. Sure would be nice if that happened. And everybody in the pews, in the chairs, standing around are all thinking. And that's because I feel like I would be one who would be lifted up, who would be liberated, who would get real justice. And Jesus, as he's rolling up the scroll and handing it to the assistant that takes care of it, says, in your hearing, this has come true. Now that's basically Jesus throwing down the gauntlet and saying, I'm coming to, pro I'm here to proclaim that we need to make this happen in the here and now. Now, a lot of the people in the synagogue were proud of Jesus because he had made a name for himself. Why, not too far away, about uh, a, a, a couple days travel in Capernaum, where a lot of the construction was taking place on, on what was to become a Roman center for trade, a lot of them got work. And they had heard that Jesus, who, when he was there, was doing all kinds of marvelous things. He was doing miraculous healings. He was teaching in ways that people were finding riveting, inspiring, and life-changing. And this hometown boy comes back to Nazareth in the synagogue there. And they hear him say, this has come true in your hearing. And they're going, Puh. Who does this little runt think he is? I mean, for crying out loud, we knew him when he was knee-high to a grasshopper. We knew him when he had to have his nappies changed. In fact, some of us helped with that. He's getting pretty big for his britches, pretty arrogant, let me tell you. In fact, what business does he have of telling us, who've been around for a while, who've got the scars of life to prove it, what business does he got of telling us how we need to live? And then Jesus answers it almost with a, with a, as if he would hear their thoughts. Oh, I know, he said, you're going to say, physician, heal thyself. Because after all, you're thinking that, gee whiz, why haven't I done what I did in Capernaum here in my hometown? What's so special about the people in Capernaum? Is it because they have all the money and the wealth and the power? He says, remember, there was a whole bunch of widows, and yet Elijah was only sent to one. There were a whole bunch of lepers, but Elisha was only there to heal one. And he was an outsider. He was a Syrian, for crying out loud. He was the enemy. But, Jesus said, it's not just for us only. Justice in the world is for everyone. Justice is not a way of, of, of leveling the playing field. Instead, it's a way of finding relational connection that is mutual, life-giving, and self-giving. It's not all about getting and dominating it's about giving and sharing 
And that is revolutionary. That is what would turn the world upside down. And the people in the synagogue, beginning to understand the import of what Jesus was trying to say, were very angry. Why, they rose up and they carried him out of the synagogue and they trussed him up and took him to a cliff on the edge of town. And believe me, in that area, there were all kinds of cliffs. It's pretty rugged terrain around the Sea of Galilee. And there they went to throw him off the cliff. But as the scripture that Mary read this morning says, he gave them the slip. We have no idea what that means. Was it that his disciples spirited him away? Was that, did they intervene? Did his family intervene? It doesn't really matter. Because he had made his point, and they, the people of his hometown, had to wrestle with the reality that what Jesus wasn't bringing, what Jesus was bringing was not a comforting message Ah, oh, isn't that nice? You know, purring kittens and baby puppies. No, this was radical. This was a life-changing call to justice. And it was also one that required them to look at themselves and the society of which they were a part and to truly consider, take the step back and recognize the inequities, the injustices, the wrongness of how they had come to find life familiar. I was um, watching a movie on Friday night. And the movie on Friday night starred Mohawk actress Kawentio, who plays the title character Tekahentahakwa otherwise known as Beans, because after all, Beans is easier to say than her actual Mohawk name. And not only that, but uh, the movie is about her character coming of age during the Oka crisis of 1990, Ganasatage, south of Montreal. And that is tough. There's a, a, a highly evocative scene near the beginning of the movie that this is taken from. This is in the pines, in a forest of pines, just on the outskirts of the Ganawage Reserve. The Ganasatake Reserve, pardon me. Ganawage is, is not too far away. And you'll, you may notice in the foreground and in the background, there are headstones because it's a graveyard. It is sacred land where the ancestors have been buried. And the two girls, Beans, who is on the right, and her little sister on the left, are dusting off the headstones, and they're picking up the twigs and stuff from off of the graves, trying to clean it up and pay respect to their elders. And the youngest one finds golf balls, dozens and dozens of golf balls and puts them in her shirt and carries them away to the edge of the gravesides and they bury them in piles of leaves as a tribute to the problems that they were having because the whole point was the dispute between the people of Ganasatage and those of the white neighbors who had taken over their land was that they wanted to expand the golf course into this burial ground in the pines. Then they hear shots, repeated shots in the background, and they run terrified to their mother. And there they come to hug her, and they're told that everything's okay. Now, beans is in grade six, just about to go to grade seven. But she's polite, cheerful, loving, compassionate. And the girl she meets, you can see her behind Beans, teaches her how to be tough. And she takes out a willow swatch and whips Beans on the thighs. 
And she says to Beans, no, you got to learn how to take the pain because if you don't, if you can't feel the pain, then nobody can hurt you. And we find out in the movie that this tough girl had been raped by her uncle. These were the barricades that were put up during the Oka crisis in this dispute over the pines and the golf course wishing to expand. Up on the top of the picture is the barricade that the Mohawk warriors had put up. And at the bottom is obviously the uh, uh, Surete de Quebec, uh, basically the equivalent of our OPP. And there they are staring off at each other. And they start to really, they're pointing their rifles at each other and their guns. You can see in the background the uh, Surete de Quebec officers. But on the other side, the Mohawk warriors too, behind their barricade, had the guns leveled, ready to fire. And the women, the one in the pink in the middle being their pregnant mother of beans and her little sister, go into the middle and face down both sides because they knew that justice would never come at a gunpoint. Justice would never be found in such a fashion. My brother-in-law, Richard Chambers, was working in 1990 for the Justice Global and Ecumenical Relations Unit of the United Church of Canada, and he was sent to Gunasatage to live there in solidarity with the indigenous residents and to try to build bridges of understanding. I was on the phone with him every night with my then wife, Nancy. And we didn't have cell phones back in those days, and it wasn't easy to get in touch with him. But when we talked, he told us of the fact that he was working to find enough food for the residents on the reserve to eat because people had blocked it off so much that nothing was let in. In fact, when some of the women had decided to go for a shopping trip to get groceries and decided to cross the water in a boat, when they went into the grocery store, they were denied service because nobody wanted their kind there. This kind of prejudice devastated Richard. And I can remember crying with him on the phone at the stories of injustice that he would share. And then just this week, we heard from the Williams Lake First Nation the fact that 73 possible unmarked graves were discovered at a former residential school through ground radar. And all I could think was, here we go again. I remember reading this in October of last year on Orange Shirt Day about Phyllis West Webstad, who wrote the Orange Shirt story. On the left-hand side is Phyllis at the end of her first year at residential school in Williams Lake, which is just two hours from Canoe Lake. That's the residential school she was forced to attend. On the right is Phyllis at 13 years old with her firstborn son. That conception was a direct result of trauma at school away from home. If you can't find love anywhere, you seek for love everywhere. And there's Phyllis Webstead as she is now, the executive director of the Orange Shirt Society. At 27 years of age, she went to put her life together again, and she's been working ever since. This is an injustice within our own country. And right now, I'm feeling uncomfortable because I feel helpless. I don't know how to change these things. Oh, sure, it's fine and dandy for me to preach about it, but what difference is that going to make? How are we going to correct the injustices of over hundreds of years of racism against our indigenous peoples? And then I think about the prophet Jeremiah and the passage that Mary read to us this morning. And I think about the reality 
that in Jeremiah, he says to God, who am I to be a prophet to the people? Who am I to tell them how to make society, the world, their living more just? Who am I? I'm just a boy. I'm inexperienced. I don't understand. I don't have the words. I don't have the tools. I don't have the wisdom. And God speaks to Jeremiah and says, hey, 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 hold on. Don't worry. I formed you before you were even born. So you need to know that you've got everything you need within you. Not only that, says God, here, send in an angel. Angel is just another word for messenger. And the angel held up a, a coal to give him the words that Jeremiah would need. This young prophet, afraid and fearful, unsure of himself, kind of like a stuttering Moses, if you will. And God said, don't worry. Wherever you are, whenever you are trying to proclaim for justice, for right relation, for reconciliation, for self-giving, for love, I'm right there with you, in you, beside you, strengthening you, encouraging you, giving you everything you need. Trust me. And I can just imagine Jeremiah thinking to himself, but I've never done it that way before. And God smiling and saying, so now it's time to learn. And so it is for us. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. God who calls us into relationships of loving kindness, who suffers with us when we suffer, who dances with us when we rejoice, who sheds wounded tears with us when we grieve, who laughs with us when we giggle in delight. Life is complicated and complex. Life challenges us each day with the complexities of relational weaving. When those of us are devastated by the death of those we love, our hearts ache and we feel helpless. When those of us wrestle with mental or physical illness, we long for treatment, for healing, for hope. When those of us become ever more isolated, alone, and lonely, we wonder if we can possibly make a difference for our neighbors. In the complexities of these relationships, our compassion and our caring arise in silent prayer for ourselves and for one another. Creator Spirit, the relationships can hurt. We consider in particular the unmarked graves recently found at Williams Lake, praying for every survivor of those precious ones revealed underground, those little ones who never made it home. We pray for families still shattered five years after the mosque murders in Quebec, fearful still at Islamophobia and hate. We pray for those all who feel weary and worn down by this pandemic, that each of us might love one another across divides of perception. We pray especially for ourselves when we feel helpless to make a difference in our collective woundedness. We offer, O oh Lord, our silent prayers. in size too deep for words. May your healing power transform our systems and our perceptions. May your guidance lead us to do justice through listening 
through and through reconciliation. Amen. Believe it or not, we got another letter this week of thanks. It was a thank you to Concordia United Church for the generous gift of $750 last year. It was to spiritual care in Gray Bruce. So here's what the letter told us our gifts helped to support. Spiritual care providers like Reverend Ken Craig, who is our chaplain at the local hospital provides a listening ear for those struggling with health care issues while creating a sense of hope amidst the emotional turmoil. Offers a companion, yep, Ken again, among others, who understands the health care system. Bedside support during times of crisis and of bereavement. Keeping me up to date with local educational opportunities for pastoral care listens deeply to the things that matter to your health and advocates on behalf of patients. Now, where does your gift go, our gift, the one that we made uh, through the mission, uh, membership and mission committee? Directly to Gray Bruce Healthcare Chaplaincy Council with no administrative fees. 80% support pastoral care providers like Reverend Ken. To every hospital in Gray Bruce, as well as residential hospices, and for the palliative care outreach team. This was a quote from, not Ken Craig in this case, but one of the uh, pastoral caregivers. The palliative patient I was visiting last month died in hospital this week. I was actually in hospital for an unscheduled visit, and I was able to get to his room and pray with him as he took his last breath. His friends and family really appreciated me being there, especially with the COVID-19 restrictions for visitors. So, Garden United Church makes a difference beyond these walls, and that is how we are living into our collective faith as a powerful witness 
Wow. Thank you to all who make that possible by donating to our operating budget. So no matter how you give to the church and to our, our shared mission, let's ask for God's blessing on all that we give. Sometimes we just don't think about what we give. Oh God, we just do it. We set up PAR so that each month our donation comes out automatically. We go online to donate electronically or we mail in a check. We might arrange for the church in our will or through our insurance policy. Every donation of our time, our talent and our treasure, however, becomes part of the tapestry of our mission in the world. Bless what we give, we pray no matter how we give, as our joyful answer to your call to reach out in love to the world. Amen. Let's join together in the final hymn, Your Hand, O God, Has Guided. Now go and be justice makers as those gathered by the one who sent love, upheld by the one who came in love, sent out in the power of love. Go in peace for justice. Amen. <laughs>